just um, notices for just those things to pick up again. As I said, um, it got mentioned again, grab the flyers, take them, hand them out, give them to people. That's cool. That's what they're there for. Uh, let's get these out and about in our community. And uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, one of the, the terms and conditions for our planning permission is that we don't cause chaos on the roads around. So we have car parking. Uh, we have base camp, we have the maltings, and we also have a car park in North Kent College that we get to use. We've got hundreds of spaces. So please, nobody, if you see anyone parking on the roads, urge them around the corner, get them into a car park. That just means that, that we can keep things happening, keep things working without any trouble whatsoever. Cool. Everyone having a good morning so far? Yeah? Cool. You're all alive. That's always a good sign. I'm going to start with a, a, a slightly different way of doing things, but I want to read out a hymn. You may be familiar with a couple of lines out of it, but, but Johnson Oatman Jr. wrote this hymn. When upon life's billows you're tempest-tossed, when you're discouraged thinking all is lost, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And he carries on, there's verse after verse. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy that you are called to bear? So amid the conflict, whether great or small, don't be disheartened because God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. I'm not sure if, if I, I don't think there was any pre-planning that went in to try and connect up sermon with worship, but you know what? Isn't that interesting when God does that? That all we've sung this morning is about gratitude for what God has done for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Again and again, in the prayer meeting this morning, that, that we open up the prayer room, 10 till half 10, as we pray for the service and for what God's doing in this place. All the prayer just kept centering around, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, God, for what you've done for us, the way you bless us, the way you hold on to us, the way that you are there for us, good times or not. But so often in life, we can, we can be like the, the, the children on, on holidays. You know, at, at any kids in the room are now on holidays have already said the words, I'm bored. Any, anyone said that? Any, anyone worked out that list? To, to be honest, we, we have so many things to do, so much that we can get on with. And the first thing that comes out of our lips when, when we, before we even think about what we could do is, I'm bored. We don't know what we're going to do. And instead of looking, instead of uh, those, those mountains of games and activities and books and all the rest of it, we so often utter those, those fateful phrases. And that's only a couple of days into the holidays. Goodness, there's so many weeks to go. But we're though so much the same. What we see in kids is, is so often just a reflection of us, just without the filter of, of how we like to look good. Kids are just so much more honest about how they feel. You know what? If, if I get boring, you lot are probably going to sit there and kind of just nod along. If it was kids, the first thing I'd see is that somebody would be picking their nose. And then someone would get up and walk to the back because I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to the toilet. I'm bored. And then, then the whole of the rest will queue up. You know these things because kids literally live out what they think. Somewhere along the line, I, it's a good thing and also a challenge that adults kind of package it and are a little bit better behaved. I hope you won't all go at the loo and I hope I won't see everyone picking their nose. But I hope you'll also be able to listen. You'll also be able to, to pay attention as we go through this this morning. But as we say thank you for things, let's, let's just be real. Let's, let's not deny that things can be tough. Let's not deny that, that life is difficult at times and the road is rough. There is, there is an honesty that we need to have. Let's, let's just be honest with ourselves. We may have reached August, but by golly, it's a, it's a different year than the one we expected last summer, wasn't it? Yeah? Let, let's just own that. Let's be real about this. Let's accept where we are. People have been ill. People have died. Let's own and accept that. Everything that we have known has been messed up in some way, shape or form. Plans for weddings, plans for house moves, plans for holidays. Things have changed and adjusted. But God hasn't changed. 
And that's the thing that we come back to, is that we change our attitude and we change our perspective. We adjust where we're looking and we choose instead to count our blessings. We don't deny everything that's gone before, but we choose to look and see it from a different perspective, from a different angle. Yesterday in here, it was um, kind of entertaining. I was at the back for a, a little bit during the service, and there was a big arch, balloon arch, and thing that had been put in the middle, and it kind of perfectly landed in the way of the camera that was live streaming the wedding to all the people who couldn't get here. And so the, the guys on, on cameras and on live stream were, were busy trying to readjust angles, and they're trying to get, they were getting a different angle. They were realizing that something was in the way, something hadn't been helpful, and they were choosing to look another way. They were choosing to pick a different angle. And that's what it's about for us. This month, we're, we're kind of moved on. We've, we've looked at missions and explored what God's called us to do. And let's, let's just not say, oh, it's packaged, we forget that. No, 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 no. But we also need to, to move into other things in the way that we look and think. So I encourage you, if you've got your Bible with you, if it's online, if it's digital, if it's physical, whatever, it'll also probably go up on screen as well. But there is something useful about looking at it when you can look it up at home or you've, you've highlighted it on you version or whatever you might choose to use. Psalm 121, a famous verse, Psalm 121, verses 1 to 2. I'll give you a second to get there. And it says this. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It's that thing. I look up to the, the mountains. I look up. But does my help actually come from there? No, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You know me. I love a bit of context. This psalm was one of the psalms of ascent. It was used by the Jews as they would climb up towards Jerusalem on the, the many pilgrimages that they had to make, multiple festivals. That's the, the whole thing about holidays, holy days. That's where all of this comes from. This is why we go to, well, we don't go abroad this year. We go camping or caravanning or wherever we can find a space. But that's why we do it. It's rooted in this concept of people leaving their homes and choosing to go up to Jerusalem, choosing to go up to, to somewhere to do something different out of their ordinary lives. And they climbed up the hills. Jerusalem's up in the hills. It's a peak. It was, it was there. It was uh, able to be fortified. It wasn't like you were walking along a valley. You were going up the hills. And for, for those of you who maybe have, have ever climbed hills, walked hills, run up hills, whatever way you want to do, what happens automatically, Lewis is nodding, if you're, if you're going up a hill, what do you end up doing? You end up looking at your feet. You, you automatically head down because you're, you're just like, oh, oh, the shoulders come in, the whole body sags. And I'm, <laughs> it doesn't look like it, but I'm part of a running group to try and do something exercise-wise and, and I'm one of the slowest you can possibly get. But you need a run leader. I need a run leader. Every time we go up a hill and... They seem to like hills. Every time we go up, the run leader's there next to you with far too much energy saying, come on, shoulders back, head up, look up. Look up, don't look down, look up. Change your perspective. And the whole thing, it, it works. As bizarre as it might seem, as you look up, your shoulders go back, you breathe easier. You look up. You get to move faster. You can see where you're going. Not just looking a couple of inches in front of you, but you're starting to see the bigger picture. These people had trudged all over the, the hundreds of miles to get to Jerusalem, and they're being told, look up, get your eyes up. But not just to the hills. They weren't told to look at the hills. They were told to look higher still. Yeah? Yeah? We can look up, we can have goals and ambitions. We can look up and, and see good things on the horizon. Maybe you have got a holiday plan. Fantastic. Maybe you are getting abroad. Good luck. Maybe you're, you're, you're staying in the UK. Hopefully that works this time. But look up beyond those things. But it's worth, as we look up, to, to start to acknowledge those things that we're saying thank you for. Because it's so, so, so easy to take good stuff for granted, isn't it? All of us do it every day. So let's do a little bit of response. Let's keep you awake. This is good. Can you answer me some questions? Can you breathe? Yes. 
Excellent, because if you couldn't, that response would be a little bit um, difficult. Can you move? Can you walk? Are you fed? Do you have somewhere to shelter tonight? Are you part of a family, biological or not? Cool. Do you have access to transport? Yeah. Even if it's an e-scooter, car or you're sorted, you've got transport. Do you have freedom to believe in God? Is there food in your house? Is your life in imminent danger because of your faith? No. No. Ooh, that caught you. (laughs) Keep you on your toes. Is there water in your taps? Food in your cupboards? Are there clothes in your wardrobe? And have you benefited from education? All those things, on a daily basis, we so often take for granted. We turn the tap on and water just comes out. We expect things just to be there. That is not always the norm. We expect things to, to flow. And, and in, the, in the habit, once things become a norm, we tend not to value them. Yeah? I'm going to possibly show my age a little bit because in the last 30 odd years of, of paying attention to cars, not very much, but a little bit, I've noticed that things that were bonuses, things that were extras that you paid more money for 30 years ago are now standard and common, yeah? So I sat down to to write a little bit of a list, things that that were extras way back that are now absolutely expected. Some of them might seem really ridiculous. Some of them, (laughs) yes, Archie, (laughs) spot on. Power steering, oh, who remembers the arm aches that used to happen, yeah? Yeah? Power steering, that's a good one. Automatic choke. Has anyone got a choke on their car anymore that they have to pull in and out? No. We've we've just completely forgotten that we had to do that to try and get the darn car to actually start. Two wing mirrors. Genuinely, I remember someone who had one wing mirror because the other one was an optional extra. You just you look back and think, really? Really? Seat belts. That's changed a bit, hasn't it? Headrests. All the luxury when you used to be able to, oh, someone got a headrest. Airbags. Now completely normal. Air conditioning. It's a good one. Radios. Remember cars without radios when nothing happened? You had no sound. Mine doesn't work now, so never mind. That's the same situation. Parking sensors. You might realise my car's not in a great state, but hey, I've got a tow bar. I don't need parking sensors. It's fine. (laughs) Heated rear windows. Central locking. Yeah? And anyone old enough to remember leaning across trying to lock all the doors? Yeah, okay. We're, we really are showing our age. Everyone who's, who's under 40 is now looking at us thinking like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Five or six gears. ABS. Cruise control. Uh, heated rear windscreen. Parking cameras. Sat-nav. All those things. Would we cope without sat-nav anymore? Ooh, yeah, oh, someone's brave. Someone, yes. Well, yeah, one thing you did used to get was a proper size spare wheel, so I'm kind of, there's a bit of balance in there. All those things have become pretty much normal. We didn't even mention alloy wheels or special tinted paint colours and all that kind of jazz. All these things that were completely exceptional have now become normal have become part of life, and we don't even acknowledge them anymore because that's how normal they are. We are blessed in so many ways. The very fact that that we are fed, the very fact that we are free to worship, the very fact that, that we are able to gather, the very fact that God has blessed us just with the very simple, practical things, we need to remember so when we, we, we sing a song that says, thank you, God, we have a list. You, if, or if we're praying, they, you don't just have to go, oh, thank you, God, for, and then ponder. Just start. Everything that you've got, everything that he's provided, it is all from him. It has all come from him. But that psalm, that psalm 121, verse 1 and 2, I mentioned it wasn't about the hills. Because the interesting thing is that when you... Go back to the, the culture. The, the original hearers of that psalm would have known the hills to have meant something slightly different. Well, I, do I look up to the hills? Where does my help come from? No, my help comes from the Lord. Well, the hills were the tops of the, the high places. The hills were the, place, were the places of idolatry. 
The hills were the places where people would, would bow down to, to idols, would, would sacrifice to idols, would worship, would uh, lift up the sun and the moon and all that kind of stuff and would distract themselves from God. The very opposite of what we're about. And it is so easy in life to, to look up and to just count the, the worldly blessings. So often... We miss God's blessings because we see and count the worldly blessings. The right car, the big house, wealth, the degree, the masters, the big ministry, the right job title, the promotion, whatever it might be. Sometimes we see that and and if we're not careful that becomes a high place. Instead we need to go back to God and thank him for what? Thank him for his grace. Thank him for his love. Thank him for the fact that that even though we don't deserve anything, he loves us. He loves us us, 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 and that sent his son to die on the cross. Nothing is ever going to add up. Nothing nothing, is enough apart from him. And he makes us good enough. We can't make it on our own. We can't get there on our own. We can't uh, honour him with our own lives. But he makes it possible. It's all about him. Only Jesus satisfies, only Jesus forgives, only Jesus restores, only Jesus makes us whole. And that's the blessings that we need to be remembering. Those are the blessings to to celebrate. And when we look at our lives, there's a a phrase I picked up a few weeks ago on retreat that, that really sinks into your soul as you listen to it. Nothing is guaranteed except God's love. Nothing, 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 nothing is guaranteed except, except God's love. Whatever situation we're in, however high or however low we may think we are, nothing is guaranteed except his love. And his love's there for us. However good we think we are, however bad we think we are, and anywhere in between, willing to forgive us, willing to to hold us, willing to restore us, if only we'll come back as that prodigal son did and say, I messed up, I'm sorry, genuinely sorry, please forgive me. That's all it takes, and we know that. But sometimes we take it for granted. It's like the, the second wing mirror on a car. It's become so natural that we forget to recognize. We even look at it, we even see Jesus, and we just don't remember what it cost. But if we're going to look up, we also need to not just glance up, we need to to fix our eyes. And we're going to take you a bit further into the New Testament. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. First few verses, I think. One, two, and three. The writer to the the Hebrews. The writer to the Hebrews was writing to the Jews at the time when, when they were struggling to understand how things were going to work out because they had the law and yet they'd come to faith and grace in, in God and they were trying to reconcile their history but with, with all that God was doing. And the writer then says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run this race with endurance that God has set before us. We do this by what? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the champion. I didn't know what the set list was, but he's the champion, yeah? Absolutely. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross disregarding its shame, and now is seated at the place of honour beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from simple, sinful people, and then you won't get weary and give up. All the things he did for us, he challenges us, conscious of everyone around us, and, and we can't see. We can't see the millions and billions of Christians who have gone before God's people called by him who are witness to what we do today. They're also witness to what we do tomorrow. Because it's not just about Sundays, it's about our daily life. 
And so we don't just look up above the hills and everything else to Jesus. We look up and we fix our eyes on him. We, we purposely fix our eyes. You can't read this verse without mentioning the Olympics. Uh, I think it was Bethany Shriver who um, won the ladies' BMX uh, a couple of days ago. Incredible to watch, but, but she put everything into that, that race, everything, that when she got off the bike at the end, literally fell off the bike, she couldn't stand. She couldn't walk, she couldn't stand, she couldn't do anything. And that's the, the origin of the picture of the guy who had just won the race before, or, or come silver, I think, holding her in her, his arms because she couldn't stand. She had given everything. That's the, the kind of sight that we need. That's the kind of dedication that we're, we're called to give our God, that we live this life so that we, we live full and die empty, to, to quote Paul Scanlon, that we've given everything that we've got. And as we come over the finish line, God picks us up. He carries us. It, it can't ever be in our strength. We need his strength. But to be in the Olympics, Bethany Shriver has, has spent years, normally four years, where it's five this time, doing all the preparation, all the work, morning by morning, late night by late night, eating the right things, training, doing the right things, disciplined daily to keep focused. It's about keeping focused. Yeah? It's about fixing your eyes on the long-term goal. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who shows us how to live, the one who guides us, the one we follow, the one we serve. And if they can do it for an Olympic medal that's been made out of smartphones, I read this morning, that have been recycled, then surely we can do it for God, yeah? For eternal life, we can live for that, for significance in God's sight. Endurance, enduring to the end. Endurance is, is being patient when everything inside you is screaming at you to stop. When you just don't want to go on. When you're tired, when you're frustrated, when you can see the way out, but you choose to stay in. That's endurance. And it's not pretty. I think the, the image that Paul gives for, for the Christian life being more like a marathon than a sprint is so true because you look at the marathon runners, okay, ignore the elite guys, but you look at the guys who run and, uh, every year in all the different marathons that go on, are they looking knackered? Yes, at times. Are they, are, they, are they giving their all? Yes. Is it hard work? Yes. They've done it. They've persevered. But when they get to the end, that last mile, they've already run 25 miles. And yet at the end, when they see the finishing line, not just in their head, but in their physical eyes, suddenly they're lifted. Suddenly they run with purpose. It's amazing you can find the, the energy to sprint after you've been tired. But they do it every time, don't they? Last week in uh, City Kids, if, apologies if you heard lots of screaming from City Kids. We were doing some crazy games. I almost got waterboarded with uh, chocolate sauce. <laughs> Different kind of church. But we were teaching, I was teaching on uh, the whole thing of Hebrews 11. The, the summary verse that kicks off Hebrews 11 is so true. It's the memory verse the kids were learning. Now faith. Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for, the assurance of things that we do not see. If you know any kids, if you see them, ask them a question afterwards. Get, see if they can remember the verse. They've been learning it for a few weeks. But we see later in that chapter, just a few verses down in verse 16, it says, Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, because he has prepared a city for them, or even for us. What a blessing to count, a heavenly country, somewhere that we fix our eyes and knowing that we're going to land. Many people don't like flying. It's a bit of a, particularly ignoring COVID, but just that idea of you're sitting in a tin can, hurtling through the air at however many hundreds of miles an hour, it sounds a bit crazy. But why do people do it, even those who don't like flying? Because of the destination they're going to. They're willing to endure the cramped seats. And let's be honest, if you're the size I am, it's a cramped seat, whatever. Yeah? Because of the purpose, the place you're going to. 
Hebrews 11, 16, as I said, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So we have these, these mental lists, maybe, of things that we're thankful for, that we're grateful for, that God has provided for us in all sorts of different ways, things he's done for you and for me. But if it's in here... How is it going to bless anyone? Genuinely, how is it going to bless anyone? If it doesn't come out of here or come out through the way that we act, it, it's locked up. It's contained. It's boxed. That song, that, the, the hymn that I referred to to start with, count your blessings, name them one by one. Speak it out. Tell people about them. It's not just important to count blessings, but it's important to recount them, to tell of them, to to say what God has done for us. David, uh, King David, when uh, the ark was moved into Jerusalem, um, it was a massive celebration. It was gradually the culmination of all that he'd been trying to do as the king of uh, the combined Israel and Judah at that time. He wrote a psalm to celebrate that. And you find it in the middle of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16. Tucked away. See, not all psalms are in the book of Psalms. 1 Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 8 to 9. It says this. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Sing to him. Tell people. Get the message out. Testimony. It's a bit of an old-fashioned word sometimes, we think. It's a habit that I think so often we've got out of. Uh, And let's be honest, we've got out of as a church. But it's time to reclaim it. Just because we haven't done something for a while doesn't mean that we don't need to do it again. Doesn't mean that we don't need to rediscover that ancient path and and tread down the weeds and the grass and whatever it might be and rebuild the fences and the the styles over them. We need to refine our paths. We need to refine our footprints, and testimony is one of those. We need to refine as a church. We need to reclaim sharing what God has done publicly. And to kick that off, I want to share with you a video. This is a video of a, a friend of mine. He actually was um, uh, Frank, Frank and Faye. Frank was part of the church here um, about 18 years ago. He's an Australian. You'll guess that by the accent immediately. Uh, and he was over here on a, a, an exchange for nine months. He was part of CPC. He was part of this church. He was uh, part of the local primary school that I was uh, heavily connected to. And we got chatting and, and discovered faith between us and And we had the privilege of going out there and spending a a couple of weeks with him um, and his family. And this testimony that we're about to show you, it's a few minutes, sit back, enjoy it. But this is somebody that we know. This is God doing something for somebody we know. This is testimony. This should encourage you and encourage me. And it's great to import a testimony from now Australia. But when are we going to export them? When are we going to be ready? When are we going to be able to share them? And I encourage you over the the next weeks and months, when God gives you a blessing, a testimony, tell us. Yeah? Tell us. We want to record it. We want to share it. We want to write it down. We want to be able to share this stuff so that not just one person or two people can be blessed, but the church, the church, not just this church, the church can be blessed. So... When you're ready. Hi, my name is Frank Davey. I'm a school teacher. I live in Les Murdy in Western Australia. And the last two years have been pretty amazing in my life. Uh, two years ago, next month, um, I went to the doctor and had a blood test. And my PSA, or my prostate-specific antigen, uh, it's uh, worrying if it's over four or five. And mine was 127. And the doctor said, look, I'm sure there's a mistake here in the lab, we'll send it, had do another test, we had another test that day, it was 129 and he very quickly sent me off uh, to a urologist who quite bluntly told me that I had uh, metastatic prostate cancer, that prostate cancer is irregular for men but the metastatic meant that it had um, spread through my body 
and uh, it had spread so far that in the prostate and then into the spine, into the femur, into the lymph nodes and uh, again very kindly but bluntly you said there's two ways we judge these things, how aggressive they are and how far they've spread and he says it just told you they've spread there and on the Gleason scale you're an 8 out of 10 so it's really aggressive and this is a shock to the system, I was fit and healthy and suddenly I'm told I've got uh, cancer that spread through my body and I remember going, in the bone? And he said, yes, in the bone. Uh, he sent me off to an oncologist and uh, she arranged, we had 18 weeks of chemo, uh, six sessions over three weeks. And um, when I came back at the end of the chemo and spoke to her and I said, look, I wanna fight this. And she says, I'm gonna be blunt with you. You don't get better from this. Uh, hopefully we'll give you five years, maybe 10 years, but you don't get better. And that was a bit of a shock to the system. And um, people prayed for me, people around the world were praying, which was wonderful. All churches, different people we knew were, I was on their prayer list, Manjim up, um, England, throughout Perth. And uh, when I'd just been, even before the chemo, my little grandson, who was six at the time, uh, he was looking upset. My daughter said, what's the problem, Levi? And he said, I'm upset about Poppy. And she said, do you want to go around and pray for him? He said, yes. So they drove around and I'm there. And I said, oh, what are you guys doing here this time of night? And uh, Nicole said, Levi wants to pray for you. So I went to a, a room and knelt down. The six-year-old boy laid his hands on me and he prayed for healing. And then he, when he said amen, he said, Poppy, God says you're going to be healed even before the operation. And uh, this was pretty mind blowing. And a couple of weeks later, all my family, my kids, their spouses, the grandkids all laid hands on, on me and prayed for me. Uh, even another specialist I went to for a skin cancer removal and uh, he heard what had happened, this Christian guy, and he said, can I pray for you? So it was wonderful, the amount of prayer. Anyway, we went through the chemo and uh, went back to the oncologist and um, she said, oh, I'm I'll, I'll just downloading your report. I had a PET scan beforehand. A PET scan is a radioactive, they put radioactive isotopes into your bloodstream and they take a CAT scan and mine came up. Any cancer comes up, high visibility yellow. And my prostate was full, chock full of cancer. And you could see it in the femur, in the spine, in the lymph nodes. Then we went back, you know, six, eight months later and had another PET scan, another thousand dollars, sadly, with no uh, rebate. And, uh, but it was a wonderful thousand dollars to spend because this time the PET scan came, the radio isotopes, I took the CAT scan and there was nothing there. And the oncologist was a quiet lady. She was nearly jumping out of her seat. She goes, this changes everything. This changes everything. And uh, the report had said complete metabolic reversal in all forms of cancer. Basically that means it's gone. There's none there anymore. And uh, I'd been healed, praise God, um, even before the operation, because even though the cancer had gone, the urologist said, you know, let's be on the safe side. Let's get rid of the prostate because it may come back again. Um, so I was healed before the operation, just as Levi had prophesied. And I praise God for that. And the thing that, I don't understand why me. I'm not a good person. So many people more deserving. But we sing a song here at Elevate that says, um, I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it. It's God's reckless love for me. And for some reason, God's reckless love touched me and changed me and healed me. I'm now back at work full time and loving life, full healthy, back on the bike, back on the kayak, my wonderful grandchildren around me. And I give God the glory because he did it. He healed me. What I love, and it chokes me up, but what I love about that testimony is that the little child shall lead them. Levi was the one, the, the six-year-old with faith who said no. And God's told me he's going to heal you before that, that operation. So we want to hear. We want to hear because it builds faith. 
We want to hear because it encourages us. We want to hear because it lifts us up to trust God for bigger and better things. We can trust him for, for the more audacious healings. We can trust him. So if you have a testimony, tell us at citypraisecenter.com. Find us at the, after the service. Chat to any of the elders. Chat to anyone you recognize on platform. We have the, the facilities to be able to, to uh, in a studio over in the other building, to be able to record that if that's the right thing or to write it down. We want to know because we want to share, not because we're, we want glory, but we want glory for God. We want to be able to point people back to God. So stand with me. Because it's all about Him. We lift our eyes not to the hills, but to above the hills. We lift our eyes to our God in heaven who can do, who will do, who does do amazing things. The God who is powerful, the God who can heal. We give you praise, Jesus. We count our blessings. We count the, the little ones and we count the big ones. And we thank you that you are the best blessing of all. That Jesus, you are here for us. That you love us and that you know us and you still accept us. And exactly as Frank said, we don't have to be good, but you love us anyway. The goodness of God. We worship you, Jesus. Flow in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. Raise up testimonies in this place of your goodness. That we may glorify you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.